So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for signing into our web webinar today. Uh, my name is Catherine McCourt. I'm a communications director at the Center for Coastal Studies. I'd like to welcome you to our first ever live dockside chat. Uh, today we've got coastal geology, seafloor mapping and preparing for climate change. So joining Rich Delaney, our president and CEO, we have Dr. Graham Geis, co-founder of the Centre for Coastal Studies and director of our Land-Sea Interaction Programme, and Dr. Mark Varelli, Marine Geology Department Chair and director of the Seafloor Mapping Programme here at CCS. So Graham Geis holds a PhD in Geophysical Sciences from the University of Chicago. He, along with Barbara and Stormy Mayo, founded the centre back in 1976. After a long career at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Graham spent time teaching oceanography at Northeastern University before returning here to the center. Graham has over 50 years experience in the fields of coastal geology and coastal oceanography. He's authored or co-authored more than 30 peer-reviewed papers and books and more than 60 unrefereed papers and technical reports dealing with physical coastal processes. Graham's a member of the American Geophysical Union, the Geological Society of America, and the Coasts, Oceans, Ports and Rivers Institute at the American Society of Civil Engineering. He's also adjunct faculty at the University of Massachusetts at Boston and oceanographer emeritus at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Now, Mark Borelli is a coastal geologist. He received his MS from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and PhD from the University of Rhode Island. Mark's research interests include coastal, geology, coastal sedimentary processes in general, and understanding how storms, sea level rise, and anthropogenic impacts affect the coast in particular. Mark's recent and ongoing research includes mapping in the seafloor in shallow coastal waters, studying bed forms and sediment transport in the near shore, and understanding the morphodynamics of tidal inlets, as well as coastal evolution on multiple temporal and spatial scales. Mark is also director of the Cape Processes and Ecosystems Laboratory, that's the Cape Lab, a joint research effort between CCS and the School for the Environment at UMass Boston. Um, before I hand you over to Rich, I want to remind you that we will have a Q&A at the end of this discussion. You can submit your questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A button on your screen. Um, some of you have sent in questions already, thank you for those. Uh, we'll answer as many as we can in the time we have, but we can also follow up with you offline. So just send us an email and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And now I'll hand you over to Rich, Graeme and Mark for our live Dockside chat. Enjoy. Catherine, thank you very much for getting this organized and uh, thanks to all of you for, uh, for joining us. Uh, I know some of you have listened to our Dockside chats in the past few weeks, actually maybe a couple months now, but this is great. This is our first live face-to-face. -face. And so it feels like we're getting back to normal just a little bit and um, I think also, I believe there are a number of you uh, who may be new to the Center for Coastal Studies on the, uh, the chat this afternoon. So uh, if our friends and members who know us well will be patient, let me just take a couple of minutes and um, give a little background about who we are and what we do and <clears throat> what our mission is um, for those who, of you who are just joining us for the first time. So the Center for Coastal Studies is a, a, a nonprofit. We conduct independent research in education and outreach activities. Uh, we all, we focus our work on understanding the complex ocean ecosystems and coastal environments. And we then try to translate or make that information available to everybody. You in our, in our listening audience today, decision makers in government and business. Uh, the reason we try to share the information is so that we can all become better stewards of the earth and the ocean. And in that way, reach our ultimate goal, our ultimate um, mission for the Center for Coastal Studies, which is to protect and conserve oceans and coasts. And we, we have a couple of distinguishing features too. We're not just a pure scientific research organization. You know, we've done that, many of our scientists do that in part, but our, our emphasis is to do what might be more likely called applied science. Science on topics that then can be applied to finding solutions. And clearly the oceans are being impacted in so many ways by so many threats that we need to find solutions to those problems. So we're really uh, in that way, uh, 
more of an applied research group. And the second distinguishing characteristic for us is we really endeavor to approach all of our work through what we call an ecosystem perspective or multidisciplinary approach. Uh, by that, I mean, rather than just look at an issue that's affecting the ocean as a biological problem or a chemical problem or a chemistry problem or a physical bi uh, processy problem, we look at all those dimensions together so we understand the, uh, the ecosystem impact and, and uh, correlations. So we, uh, we've been around for 46 years and we're thrilled and just honored to have one of those founders with us today, Dr. Graham Geis, who uh, is still going full time out in the dunes and doing measurements and doing research. And he's just a, it's a treasure that we, we, we have and so happy to have you with us today, Graham. Um, I will say that when we started this organization, when Graham started 46 years ago, uh, it was really, um, began with a membership, as a membership organization, or shortly after that, and we still are a membership organization today. So I will tell you a little bit more about this when we finish the, uh, the discussions this afternoon, but please note that we are a group that needs to have funding coming from a lot of sources. Some of you in the audience are very generous members and donors, but our scientists are always writing grant proposals to competitive organizations to receive funds to do our research. We do have a few contracts with government agencies. They enlist us and, and we contract with them to do some of the, the responsibilities that they and we share in terms of protecting endangered species. But uh, it's really an organization that needs lots of support and lots of memberships and lots of interest. So that's why I'm really thrilled that you are all joining us today and, and I think at the end of this conversation, you'll see just why uh, a lot of people really value this organization, as I hope you do too. So I'm not going to talk too much longer right now. There will be a Q&A, and you can ask me some questions as well at the end. But I will um, <clears throat> turn, before we turn to, to the topic of the day, i um, like to just make one more point. All of the research and activity we're doing now is being impacted across the board pretty much by a rapidly changing climate. As the Earth's temperature, average temperature and ocean temperature rises, it is having consequences far and wide across every segment of the population in every, almost every aspect of our environment. So when you'll hear about some of the discussions today, uh, you'll understand why the work that Mark and Graham are doing in terms of coastal processes and ocean research is now one of the most important things we're doing at the center because that's the issue, that's the area where people really begin to see and take um, note of the changes that are being brought about by climate change. Sea level rise, storm surges, that's where people say, wow, maybe this is happening. So I think that will be an introduction to some of the, some of the topics you'll hear today. But I've talked probably too long already. I'm gonna ask Graham, if he would um, please take a couple minutes before we actually get to the Q&A to tell us a little bit more about himself. You heard his impressive resume from Catherine, but Graham, maybe a little bit about how you got involved and why you started this center and uh, what your sort of an overview of your, your most important research topics would be. And uh, that would be great as a little warm up to uh, our, the rest of the presentation. So Dr. Graham guys, please. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you very much. And thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm delighted to be here and uh, delighted that all of you are here uh, with us. Uh, it's been a long time since we've been separated and it's, uh, it's a joy to get, get, get back together. Uh, I, I, uh, in more detail, a little bit uh, on, on my background is uh, I'll, I'll come up with right away. But uh, first, I'll say that I uh, am very appreciative to both uh, Rich and and Mark uh, to still be at the center because in fact, while I am working at the center, I am uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also retired. So I'm a, I'm a scientist emeritus now and working uh, half time uh, and um, working together with Mark uh, in a program that uh, you'll hear about as, as both, of us, both of us talk. So for me, uh, it's a great honor uh, to, be, uh, to be with this uh, group in the form that it is today, because it's certainly uh, it, it's 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 a, a far cry from uh, where where it was when we began. 
Um, let's see. So as far as I'm concerned, yeah, I uh, I was born in uh, in Virginia uh, uh, during the Great Depression and uh, went uh, to college in Connecticut and then uh, into the army during the Korean War. Uh, uh, I was sent uh, to Europe, not uh, Korea, I'm happy to say, and uh, studied uh, at uh, the Army uh, Engineer School in, in Europe. And uh, that was my introduction to the work that I'm still doing today, and that's surveying. I uh, came back uh, out of the Army, uh, uh, got a job at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which was at the time looking for a surveyor. So it, it worked out uh, very well for me. Um, this is back in 19, what was that, 56. Uh, and my first job um, uh, uh, was uh, to go out to Orleans, an hour Cape Cod, I'd never been there before, um, and surveying a, a, survey a little spit that was growing uh, northward uh, at Nauset Inlet from Nauset Heights. Uh, the inlet had been down south at Nauset, Nauset, uh, Nauset Heights. And there's a little spit starting to grow northward. And uh, my boss said, I that was named, by the way, John Seidler, uh, my mentor for years, uh, said I should uh, use my skills and, uh, and uh, make a plain turbid map of it. And I did. And uh, uh, we might get back to that later, but that, uh, it has a lot to do with what, what our present work is today. A second uh, job was uh, to uh, uh, reproduce surveys that had been done back in the uh, 19th century uh, by a, a, a great surveyor, um, scientist named Henry Morendon, and uh, that looked at coastal change. Uh, uh, he had looked at coastal change, and we used his data uh, to uh, determine the change uh, between his time and, and that time. And again, we're still looking, looking at that. When I say we, uh, the, all these, uh, the work that we're doing today is uh, work that I'm doing uh, with other people, that uh, it's, it's that association uh, with others that have uh, made my work possible, and I'm indebted to so much to, to all of them. Uh, Cape Cod National Seashore, working with uh, Mark Adams, um, uh, that's allowed um, uh, allowed for the um, uh, the, the Marinda surveys to continue, and, um, and 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 they are right up to the present time, uh, and and and. Of course, Rich uh, and Mark Borelli, uh, those are the other two of the three who have uh, brought me to the, uh, given me the opportunity to, to uh, continue the work uh, that I was doing back then and uh, to uh, share it with others. And, uh, and as I say, now that I'm uh, uh, retired, I'm able to uh, I'm happily keep in, keep my hand in. Uh, but see it go way beyond where it was uh, when I when I left off. Uh, right now, uh, my present work is uh, uh, working with uh, a mark on sediment budgets uh, on Cape Cod Bay of discrete uh, coastal transport sediment transport units from Chatham to to Plymouth. And uh, maybe maybe we'll have some more time to talk about that that later. Um, and. Uh, I think that pretty much brings me up to where I am, working with groups and units. Yep, yep, that's that's it. And uh, so I think I'll turn that over to uh, to Mark. Okay, or, thanks, Chris. Rich. You want to go back? And, no, that's right. No, yeah. I just want to I just want to say by way of introduction to Mark, we've been teaming up since nineteen uh, two thousand nine. He came to the center and has really given great energy and vision and creativity to the department and has grown it in so many fabulous ways. And uh, so we're pr I'm proud of what Mark has been doing and happy he's part of the team now. So Mark, can you tell us a bit more about your media background? Sure. Your overview? Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Rich. Uh, I would like to say I should not be telling my life story after Graham. That's not a good idea, right? That's kind of <laughs> setting me up for failure there. Um, but that's okay. Um, so I was actually born, born in Massachusetts. I was the kid who came down to the Cape, you know, once in a while in the summer times and um, as we got older, we would come down, friends and I, and camp in tents, and we were the people in the tents you didn't want to be next to, right? So, uh, but we had a lot of fun down here and just sort of really liked spending time out here. Um, as I got older, went back to school, didn't really know what I wanted to do when I went back to school. I, um, I got into Tufts University and I had a geology program there and it just uh, really turned me on to, to the field. Um, you know, didn't, had no idea you can make a living doing this stuff, right? So that was great. Um, I went to, as Catherine mentioned, I went to the uh, 
University of North Carolina for my master's degree. So I got to do research on the Outer Banks, which is a great place for a coastal geologist to work and learn how to do this stuff. Uh, and then I came back closer to home, went to the uh, University of Rhode Island where I got my PhD and my PhD work was in Chatham Harbor. Um, and as a sort of um, a general a professional courtesy, when you're working in someone's field area, you give them a call, you let them know, hey, I'm gonna be doing some work in, in, in Chatham Harbor. So I called a lot of the people who'd worked there. And of course, one of them is Graham, who's done some seminal work in the area. Uh, and everybody, you, you know, you call, you reach out to these people and say, oh, that's good. It's good to know, keep me posted. Graham invited me down for lunch. He wanted to get together. He wanted to talk about it. He was really engaged. He barely knew me. We had, we had said hello a couple of times and he was just so happy to talk about geology and science. And it was really, really a nice, nice experience. Um, and as I was getting my, my, my PhD, I worked for a couple of years um, at CZM um, where Rich was the executive director years before. Um, but I worked there to learn the policy side of it. Then I got a job with the National Park Service uh, being a storm hazard analyst. And that again, took me back to Chatham to, to, because there was a lot of activity there in 2007 when the inlet opened up. Um, and then this job application, I got an email from Graham and there was a job announcement and it said, hey, there's a three year project uh, starting in 2009. And he said, you know, send this around to everybody you know, we wanna advertise it widely. And I said, hey, what about me? Um, I could do this job. And Graham was, you know, he said he was, oh, that's great. It was happily, you know, he's surprised and happy. And we talked about it. And, you know, folks, I hate to say this, Rich, but the reason why I came here was to I get to work with Graham for three years. Um, didn't think it was going to last longer than that, quite frankly. I said, oh, I'm going to have a place. I'm going to get to spend time on the Cape. Going to get to work with Graham. Um, but we were in the right place at the right times. A lot of being on, the, being on Cape Cod um, as a coastal geologist is, it's like Mecca, right? This is where you want to be. You have, because of the Cape Cod National Seashore, you have this 40 mile natural laboratory that you can study and, and just be in uh, and really understand how this stuff all works. So it's, it was a wonderful opportunity. Uh, and Rich has, has, an, has created an environment at the center as long as I've been there, that it's, it's open and free and you can, as, as long as you can pay for it, you can, you can do just about anything you wanna do if you're doing good science um, and making a contribution. And that's one of the things we like to do. And, and I'm just, you know, really, really happy to be here. So, so yeah. Great, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, and thank you all out there for, for being with us today again. So let's, um, let's turn to, it's your turn to talk and to ask some questions. I know, Catherine, uh, I'm going to ask you to kind of moderate the questions as they've come in before. And uh, wait, let's get right to it. All right. Thank you. Um, just before we get to that, I just, uh, let me just, double check on some information here. Um, I think be, be, just for a couple of minutes before we get to our audience questions, I wonder if Rich and um, if Graham and Mark could speak to a couple of specific projects that they have that, that relate particularly to climate change and, and how it's impacting Cape Cod and, and elsewhere for us. Graham, would, would you mind yeah. going? Yeah, well, that's, I think it's sure, a good question. Maybe, maybe the storm type pathways, Mark, and, and some of the sediment studies that you've been doing, Graham? Yeah, Graham, why don't you start with the sediment budget, and then I'll do the, the other storm type pathway stuff. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, I, I mentioned the sediment budget work, uh, I think, when I was talking earlier, introducing myself. Um, I should say that uh, all of that work uh, uh, that, that I've been doing uh, on that program develops from my uh, interest in the interaction between uh, the land and the sea. Uh, and basically what that is, is the interaction between marine processes and the coast. That, that's what coastal processes are. It's, it's uh, the, the, the interaction between marine processes and, and, and the coast. And the marine processes are uh, waves, tides, currents, and sea level. Sea level fall, rise, whatever it is, wherever the sea level is, those are the those are the characteristics of the sea, the sea, the, the marine processes that 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 make up coastal processes. And um, of all of those, sea level is the most important one of all. Uh, it it, uh, it it it's what causes our erosion on Cape Cod. Our erosion is, for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, can be. Uh, uh, looked at as a, as, as a reaction, as a response uh, to, to uh, the change in the sea level, rise of sea level. Uh, and so uh, what 
we're looking at right now is the way that the coast, uh, uh, all the way, as I said before, from Chatham to Plymouth, uh, responds to this, uh, uh, the sea level rise through erosion and deposition. And we find that uh, the response um, can be uh, looked at uh, as changes within five separate individual units. Uh, uh, that is uh, sediment transport units uh, between which there is no net sediment transport. Uh, Outer Cape is one and uh, the province town to uh, Wellfleet on the Bayside uh, areas is another and, and so forth. Um, so, um, but I can't do that work uh, if I don't know how the shore is changing uh, offshore. Uh, the, because the, the changes uh, extend from the furthest reach of the sea in the land and the, and, and the furthest seaward reach are the waves on the bottom. That's our active zone. And uh, it wasn't until Mark came that we were able to find out what the, what the uh, change was offshore of the beach. We, not, we, knew, we, knew, we knew it was important. Now we find out that it's critical. And so, um, that's that's uh, that's where we're, that's where we are today. That's my work is uh, working with Mark using those data uh, to better define uh, the uh, erosion and deposition processes and change in form, which characterize characterizes these specific uh, sediment transport units. That's it. And, and Graham, if I if I may just add, that understanding is becoming increasingly valuable to town management groups as they think about whether or not they, how to deal with changes in their shoreline, whether or not they're thinking of wh whether there may be some erosional spots or some depositional spots or harbor dredging, all the activity that's going on on the waterfront by those towns, uh, when the towns feel they need to take some action, this information will better inform them as to what the ramifications of any change on the shoreline might be. So I think it's a great example of knowledge that we develop applied to decision makers to be better coastal stewards. That's true. Uh, Mark, um, how about the storm type pathway? Yeah, um, let's see. So Steve McGue and I, uh, who is another person uh, at the center, he's a, a cartographer years ago, 2014, 2015, we were looking online at some of these uh, sea level rise websites and where they show you the extent of inundation. And, um, and we were just talking out loud and we, one of us said, wouldn't it be good if you could find out how the water is getting there, right? Not just where the water will go to, to a certain elevation, but how is the actual water getting there? And we just came up with this idea of mapping what we call storm tide pathways. Uh, basically, we're just trying to figure out uh, during a certain flood event, uh, how the water gets from the ocean into uh, inland. So what we, de we developed this method using the software that we use in the seafloor mapping program, the data visualization software, to slowly increase the level of, sea, of water, uh, increase the sea level, uh, and s follow the water in uh, into inland areas. And basically, we started doing this project in Provincetown, uh, and then we showed those results at a conference. And the next person behind me was uh, from the National Weather Service, and he said, "You know, together with these, with our models of total water level and your mapping of the pathway the water will take, it's a nice combination." So we got another grant funded and. Uh, that grant came out in 2017 for Province Town of Truro. And then unfortunately in 2018, we had January 2018, we had that flood event uh, in New England. There's a new storm of record. It was a little beyond, um, a little beyond the, the blizzard of 78, which was the old uh, storm of record. Um, and it, it went through one of our pathways. We had mapped one of the storm type pathways and, and some downtown flooding in Province Town. It went right through there. And um, so that's an interesting story. Uh, it's an interesting um, uh, product that we're working on with the towns and the state actually. Uh, but what's really interesting is that we, there was six inches of sea level rise between 1978 and 2018, right? The, the, the sea level went up about six inches um, during that time. Um, and the flood from 2018 was six inches higher than the blizzard of 1978, right? So the amount of sea level rise that occurred over that time was about the same in the difference between the old storm of record and the new storm of record. So what you've got is you've got tangible evidence that sea level rise is impacting a coastal area. Um, but the most fun part of that is that the reason why we know what the elevation was in Provincetown in 1978 is Graham measured it. 
during the blizzard of 78. So he was out there measuring it. We used that data 40 years later to, to ascertain, yep, and we didn't have to use the Boston tide gauge. We, have, we had grant measuring in 78. We have a tide gauge there in, in 2018. So we could actually measure that. So that's, that's a nice little application that has, has some real world applications. So we were, we were happy about that. <laughs> that's a great story. And, and, and illustrative of the advances in technology. Now, 40 years later, Mark doesn't have to don his, his, his raincoat gear and go out and measure like, like uh, Graham did. He can just sit in front of his computer and read the, 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 the readings from all the uh, equipment we've stationed out in the, along the coastline. Which is good and bad. <laughs> True, yeah, yeah, good point. <laughs> so, so storm tide pathways, very innovative. Uh, I think we may be the only people around who are actually put this kind of technology, these two methodologies together to really help. It's, our, it's again, a great example of a practical solution to help people, um, Mark alluded to it, but people like the DPW directors in these towns need to know where they are going to have to address flooding along their streets and, and, and uh, neighborhoods. And if we can help direct them to those more vulnerable spots in advance, knowing when certain sea level rise and certain storm surge happens together, um, great information. And it's a great solution for um, increasingly uh, negative impacts from climate change on coastal communities. Mm -hmm. So great. Um, thanks, Catherine, for, for setting up those two talks. Uh, I think now we probably should save some time for others who probably want to ask some questions. Yeah, and actually we have a, a great first question right off the bat. This is from Shirley in Provincetown. Uh, what measures can or are being used to protect vulnerable areas from flooding and coastal erosion? Um, sure. So I will say that, so I'll give you a local example. I know that Provincetown and Truro have used that the Storm Tide Pathway uh, app online with the National Weather Service uh, to plan for a coming storm. So the National Weather Service will predict the total water level uh, and they'll say it's say for instance 14 feet, it's going to be 14 feet. So now they'll go to that map and look at where that 14 feet of water is going to go and they do things as simple as sandbagging, right? They'll do things, they have these portable flood walls where uh, DPW uh, people can move these flood walls and they actually form a, a waterproof barrier around an area. Uh, there are long-term efforts, obviously. We, we found, we're just finishing a storm type pathway uh, project in situate in Cohasset, because we do stuff all around. Um, and we found that for every six inches of water level increase, 100 acres gets inundated in, in situate in Cohasset. All right, so for every six inches, so if you can prevent uh, uh, that just a little bit of little bit of water, six inches of water, you can prevent those hundred acres from getting flooded during a storm, right? So there's short-term planning in terms of some, something as simple as sandbagging and, and those flood walls, um, and then there's long-term planning. Again, if you're talking about six inches, you could raise the crown of a road, right? If, if if a road happens to be that barrier to to water flow, you could simply just raise that crown of a road. Um, Provincetown itself is trying to build a dune in one of the places where there's a um, uh, a storm tide pathway. So that's a nice natural solution in places where it's possible. Uh, people are very innovative and they're doing very, uh, a lot of different things. The question is, what are the impacts of the resources and how long do you want to prevent water from flowing there? Something like a dune will take care of itself, right? If it's built right, it'll, it'll self-sustain if you take care of it. Uh, and there are other, other things that, that have to be maintained and taken care of or removed, depending on what the time scale is. Thanks, Mark. Um, I know you've done some work in Herring Cove as well with the National Park Service. Um, yes. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and how the Park Service is, is planning to deal with sea level rise in the future? Yeah, that's a project that Graham actually, um, I think Graham was first contacted for this project early on when they started talking about it. And then I, I came on board too. This is a project that's really interesting for those who don't know. Herring Cove Beach is an area in Provincetown where there was a parking lot right on the water. There was a park, and I mean right on the water. At high tide, you, it would come onto the asphalt at times because it was so low. Um, and it would get damaged a lot. Um, uh, there was a lot of different uh, reasons. Graham's done a lot of research there, and he'll talk in a minute about it. But um, at some point, I think it was 2012, 2013, they were seeing every winter this, this uh, parking lot would get undermined, and they'd have to do hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of uh, repair to this parking lot. Um, and then around, right around 2012, 2013, they decided, all right, we're going to move this parking lot. So you had a situation where the Park Service had land uh, and they did a managed retreat, a managed relocation. 
And based on the analysis that Graham did and Mark Adams of the seashore, uh, um, we, we, we got a handle on the back, background erosion rate to figure out where the shoreline might be in 20 years, 50 years, and 100 years. And the, the seashore actually moved the parking lot from where it was around the water 200 feet back, right? They removed the dune, they built another uh, area, uh, and they recreated that natural environment. So now the beach can do whatever it wants. If it erodes a little bit one year, it's okay. It'll accrete the next year, and then you'll have this long, slow progression landward as sea levels rise and storms continue. So they, that was touted as one of the best examples uh, nationwide of how to, how to manage that resource. So people still have access to the beach. They still have access to that resource. They can still see the right whales there at a certain time of the year, right? Um, um, but, but it was a really good idea of moving it in a way that you know, plans ahead. And, and Graham, yeah, I mean, we, that was a really interesting project. I don't know if you wanted to, yeah, you know. Yeah. it's true. No, I really don't have anything to add. I think you've covered it very well. And uh, certainly the Seashore uh, National Park Service uh, has, has responded beautifully, I think. Yep. yep. All right, thank you. Catherine, if I, uh, if I could just, just, just um, Mark used the word accrete. And uh, I just realized some of the our audience might not be oh, sure. really conversant with coastal geological terminology. Sure. And uh, accretion, of course, is the opposite of erosion. There are spots along the coastline where we're losing sand, but there are also other areas where it is gaining or accreting or building up. Yep. And understanding that, that dynamic of why it does either is what Graham has pioneered the research on. But I just want to clarify that that term. I hope I did it properly, Mark. Is that yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Rich. No, erosion in one place is accretion somewhere else, right? Um, so yeah, that's a really important point. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I think the next one is probably going to be for Graham. And um, this is from Brenda in Duxbury. Um, please explain the effects of a seawall on a beach. No, well, uh, I'd love to talk about that and say hello to Brenda if she's, uh, she's online. I can't see the audience, but uh, uh, greetings, greetings, Brenda. Uh, I think uh, the effect of a seawall on a beach is a good example of uh, why we put such emphasis on the interaction between the land and the sea. Uh, because certainly uh, if uh, you're troubled by a loss of uh, some land area, uh, you could uh, at least temporarily preserve that area by putting a wall of stone or cement or wood or whatever in front of it uh, to keep the sea from getting there. But the problem with that is, is that the land and the sea interact with each other. The, the coast is self-organizing. And so uh, if you stop that response uh, of the land to the sea, the sea is is going to respond in another way. And that's exactly what it does uh, with seawalls. Uh, uh, turbulence is caused by breaking waves during storms in front of the seawall. And uh, there's uh, increased erosion uh, at that part of the, of the shore. And that's not only directly uh, at the, at the um, site of the seawall, we now know uh, due to the work that uh, we're able to, to, um, to do with Mark's uh, information from offshore. But what we find is that the entire shore, uh, this entire uh, coastal area becomes steeper uh, during these erosion events. And so even though we don't see any erosion at the, at the, land, uh, inter at the land interface, at the, uh, at the intersection of the land and the sea, which is of course specifically at the, at the seawall of the breakwater, it doesn't stop the erosion. The erosion is still going on and it's going on down that shore face all the way to the point at which uh, waves first come into the shore. So what we're really doing is setting ourselves up for a worse situation than we had to begin with. And so uh, we have temporary ways of dealing with, with this. Uh, you can add sand right at the beach, but of course that doesn't decrease the steepness. In fact, to a certain extent, it increases the steepness because uh, it's still eroding deep offshore, but not at the shore. So the whole the whole system is getting steeper. Um, so what we can do it. We, we, we can keep adding material and adding money um, and, and protect it. We, it we, we can do that. That's called engineering. And uh, coastal engineering can protect uh, these systems, uh, but with increasing uh, expense as time goes on. So that's where we are. That's sort of the catch 22. Um, 
with trying to um, trying to what we think is correct um, a, a, what we call a problem at the seashore. From the natural point of view, uh, the, the erosion is not a problem. It's a process of uh, of uh, of uh, causing equilibrium, of bringing about an equilibrium state between the land and the sea. Uh, a situation which left to its own self would decrease the change through time of the whole system. Through time, if, if, if the process is allowed to go on unchecked, it will uh, produce a, 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 a system which has a slower rate of change than the one that we started with. And this is all due to sea level rise. It's due to climate change. This is climate change that we've had. This is, we're talking now with the one foot uh, per, per hundred year rise in sea level that we have. Uh, that's more than we've had in the last 6,000 years. Uh, and I say we've had, I mean, we Europeans haven't seen that at all. Native Americans certainly did, and they weren't particularly bothered by it. Uh, certainly moving, moving back was what they did in the way that Mark just mentioned. Um, we have to be able to move back also. I hope that that, that, that answered the question. It, it, that, that's, the, that's the ultimate effect of, uh, of a seawall uh, protecting a shore. It can be done, but it, it, it not only costs a lot, but it costs increasing amounts through, as time goes on, not only at that spot, but for the, for, but for the system as a whole. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that it's almost impossible to know what's going on in the coastal system by just looking at the beach, right? You can't walk around a beach, mm -hmm. walk along a beach at low tide and get a sense of what's going on in the entire system, right? Uh, that's, that's really the, the hard point to get across to people. They think if they, they build that wall, now the erosion problem has stopped, right? I don't have to worry about this anymore. The wall's there and this, this erosion problem has stopped. And like Graham said, erosion is not a problem, right? Ero and I said erosion, one place is accretion in another. Once you stop that erosion from happening at that location, you're just redirecting that energy somewhere else. Um, and, and that's why you get these long shorelines with revetments and seawalls for miles and miles and miles. Um, so yeah, that's, it's, it's an important uh, idea to remember. Good question. Thank you. Um, Graham, you mentioned about replenishing beaches. Is there any truth to the, to yeah. the concept that we're actually running out of sand? Uh, I guess we're running out of sand uh, that uh, the world is running out of sand. Uh, in Cape Cod, uh, we're all, we're made of sand. And so the, uh, the sea will erode the sand that's uh, along in this active zone uh, and make things uh, uh, more unstable, as I say, if you protected the shore at the, just at the shoreline. So, uh, the, 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 as far as the, we're, we're certainly running out of sand as far as engineering is concerned the, the sea isn't running out of sand and the land isn't running out of the sand but in terms of engineering absolutely we're running out of sand all right thank you um okay one for both of you um richard from wellfleet what will be the effect of sea level rise on wellfleet harbor Ooh. um Boy, that's a, that's a complex question. Um, there's gonna be lots of different impacts, right? Uh, there's a lot of low-lying areas in Wellfleet. Some of the work, I mentioned the storm tide pathway work that we're doing, uh, that we started in Province Town Toro, we did a little in uh, uh, situated in Cohasset. We're doing all actually throughout Cape Cod Bay. So we're actually working on a project to map all the storm tide pathways. Uh, we've done Province Town Toro to do from sandwich all the way to Wellfleet. So we're gonna, we're gonna be really high resolution maps uh, of the storm tide pathways for Wellfleet at six inch increments. So there's gonna be a really detailed data set coming out uh, probably early next year. And we're gonna be able to tell you what the inundations are gonna be, where it's gonna go, how it's gonna get there and that kind of thing. Um, the impacts, it's hard to answer that question in a simple way because there's all these unintended consequences. There's all these you know, trigger events where one thing happens and it sets off things that weren't really in existence before. And now it's gonna have impacts, broad, much broader impacts in different areas. Um, I don't ever have a really good answer. It's going to get wet, you know. <laughs> it's it, it's it's tricky, and not to mention it's not just sea level rise because with climate change, the oceans are getting more uh, uh, acidified, right? Ocean acidification is a problem. That's going to affect the shells, the oyster shells, uh, and and uh, other shellfish. So 
seal rise in and of itself is one right. issue, but it's uh, it's a hard one to to answer, obviously. So to add to, uh, to that, simply that um, the uh, shore structures uh, are fixed and the shoreline is not fixed, and so uh, as um, as sea level rises and of course uh, the tides continue, uh, the the the, uh, the the storm uh, uh, wave damage that Mark is talking about simply uh, works works its way up the shore. Uh, and and uh, uh, infrastructure is in the way. Yep. And so the effect really will be to increasingly uh, endanger uh, human infrastructure. We get a little peek at that during really bad storms, right? You get these really bad storms with all this storm surge. That's, that is going to be sea level at some point, right? That's going to be your sort of mean sea level at some point, right? That's going to be your high tide, your low tide. So that gives you a little indication of all, where, where the water is going and and how it's gonna get there uh, during those events like storm events or even king tides. And you get these so-called king tides, the highest high tides of the year. You get that same little preview of what sea level rise is gonna be and it's gonna be problematic because as I mentioned in situate, uh, these areas are really flat and, and a little bit of sea level rise can inundate large swaths of area. And they're almost always um, you know, coastal, uh, uh, nicer uh, properties, nicer areas, right, of more value. So there's going to be more of an issue there too for the towns because it's a it's a considerable part of their tax base. Mitch, do you want to add anything to that? I might just I might just add that from a policy perspective, uh, this information is I think it's evident from both of the comments that Mark and, and Graham have made is vital and critical for town planners who are going to make decisions today about how the future of those of our towns will unfold and will develop and will change. And, and retreating really is, it has to be an option. We should not be planning and encouraging and subsidizing more growth and development in these storm tide pathways or these low line areas. We've really known that intuitively and coastal zone management policies have said that for 40 years. But now the evidence is dramatic. And we know it's happening not only in the future, but faster than we anticipated as sea level rises and all the climate change impacts happen more quickly. So I think if there's a take home message for us as citizens to convey to our town officials and elected officials, use this information to make wise decisions now about the future of the town. Why? It's going to happen. We're showing you that. Number two, we need to make plans now to protect our health and the health of the community. And it's going to be costly. Those impacts are going to start costing lots of money for, for urban infrastructure and built infrastructure along the coastline. So the more we can retreat now and plan for it in a rational way, the better. So this is really um, a, a wonderful example, sadly, of are science that matters, science that helps with the applications. Well, one thing I will say, uh, you know, Rich just said it's going to happen. In some senses, it already has. If you go back 100 years and talk to people who lived out on Billingsgate, there used to be a little town out there, right? There used to be, uh, I think, 40 to 50 people living out there year round. There used to be a school, a lighthouse, um, a processing plant for, for fish. That already happened, right? Sea level rise removed, that, that area is no longer livable, right? So, what is going to happen to Wellfleet has already happened to part of Wellfleet, right? Billingsgate is gone. That little village is gone. And it's because of sea level rise. So we, we already know what's gonna happen. It's just, you know, we don't, uh, we don't know exactly, but we, you know, in the long term we do. So we have to start planning for it. Great, thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, just a quick one, actually. How do, do you use citizen scientists at all in the research that we do in the geology department? Oh boy, yeah, we sure do. We have, um, so we have a lot of, one of the things we do in the seafloor mapping program is we make benthic habitat maps, right? So we use the acoustic data uh, from the ships, the sonar that Graham was talking about earlier, but then we go get, gra we uh, collect bottom grab samples. And we collect, we collect these bottom grab samples so we can look at these tiny little critters, these little macro invertebrates that we have to look at underneath a microscope. Well, when we collect this big um, four liter uh, uh, sample of sand, 
volunteers, citizen scientists actually pick through this, uh, the sand forest to pick out the, the macroinvertebrates. So our scientists, our benthic ecologists can identify them. And then we can start getting a handle on abundance and biodiversity and see what the system is doing and if it's healthy and if it's, you know, where it is in its evolution. Um, so we have racked up, I want to say we've racked in 2019, obviously 2020 is a little skewed. I think it was over 2,000 volunteer hours to help us with that project. 2,000 hours of volunteers coming into the lab and, and, and picking through these samples to help us do our science. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a hugely wonderful resource of the citizen scientists that help us uh, and they get jazzed about it. They, they love doing it and they're, they're just fantastic. It's a big help for us. And quite frankly, I don't know if we could do it without them because that's, it's, it's, it's a huge amount of work. That's great. Thank you. We definitely do less of it. That's for sure. <laughs> definitely. Good, to, good to know. So if we have any volunteers out there for 2021. <laughs> um, we covered this briefly earlier, but um, can either of you speak to the need for managed retreat as a long term strategy for dealing with climate change, sea level rise? Uh, yeah. So it's repeat that question. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. uh, can you speak to the need for managed retreat as a long-term strategy for adapting to sea level rise? We covered it briefly earlier. Yeah, I, I think, well, uh, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's about political will, right? I mean, it makes sense, right? But how do we do this? And, and I always hear planners saying, boy, if we could just wipe the slate clean and start fresh, right? But that happened after Hurricane Sandy in New Jersey. Right, the, the the storm wiped the slate clean, unfortunately, and and there were there were politicians there who said we're going to build this back the way it was, bigger and better, as a matter of fact. So they had their chance to wipe the slate clean, and and the political will wasn't there to say let's see if we can do this a little better, let's see if we can do this with less impact, let's see if we can move some of these some of these more hazardous or more high risk areas or structures out of this area. Um, so, you know, with sea level rise, I mean the projections for sea level rise. I mean, Graham was mentioning it's been about, it's, it's about a foot over the last century. Some of the pro projections for 20, 2100 in 80 years are four feet, six feet, even eight feet, right? Eight feet of sea level rise in 80 years. That means, and now it's not a, it's not a linear thing, right? It's a rate, but that means on average, you're going to have a foot of sea level rise per decade, as opposed to a foot of sea level rise per century in a worst case scenario. And unfortunately, we're really good at hitting these worst case scenarios. If you look back and, and like do the hind casting where you look back in 1991 and look at projections for now, you look back into 2001 and look at projections for now, we're really pretty good at doing this. And the worst case scenarios right now are four, six and eight feet uh, by the 2100 and it's unimaginable to do without managed retreat. So yeah, we better figure out how to do that because I don't think there's other way around it. And, and, and Kevin, I, I would add that those scenarios, which are increasingly becoming true, and they're very well researched and modeled, uh, would suggest that the adaptation that we're talking about, you know, retreating, should also be preceded by and start immediately mitigation. In other words, I guess another way to say it, the best thing that any individual here in the Cape or anywhere can do to help offset the problems facing the coastline is to reduce their carbon footprint. So we can slow down the amount of co co uh, carbon dioxide that is being in other greenhouse gases that we as a society are producing and emitting into the air, which is the source of the problem, and warming the atmosphere, which warms the oceans, which causes all the issues that we've been projecting. That's a better way, it's an, an equally important way to get at the source of the problem as well as what we've been talking about today, deal with adapting solutions to the problem. So look at, uh, look at yourself, look at your carbon footprint. Uh, I might just take this opportunity to mention a group called the Cape Cod Climate Change Collaborative. It's a kind of spin-off organization of, of those of us at the center. And its mission is to help people understand ways that they can as individuals and as businesses and as other organizations together can reduce their carbon footprint. And their, their website is just www.capecodclimate.org. So I'd, urge, I'd, I'd encourage people to look at that if you want to be part of the solution by dealing with reducing carbon dioxide. Great. 
Thank you very much. Um, we have about five minutes left. So one last question. Um, how, how best can we communicate this, not only to our members and to the people on these webinars, but um, you know, to our greater community and to those folks that are actually making those decisions? How, well, how I think in part, in part, we have to start uh, with schools. I know that uh, everything we said has suggested immediacy and, uh, and that's absolutely true, uh, especially uh, the last uh, topic, which had to do with uh, responding or treating and uh, that has to be thought of right away. And as Rich said, uh, certainly all the climate change um, uh, concerns uh, tell us that we need immediately to change our, our ways of, of behaving. But we also have to think of the children. Um, when I look around uh, the Cape, uh, I realize that uh, the stories that we've been telling for 50 years uh, about uh, coastal change, the uh, inevitability of it, uh, uh, need to be told again and again. Uh, and uh, children, uh, when we spoke to them 50 years ago, those people uh, today uh, have got it. But uh, the young children who haven't heard it don't have it. And they won't have it when they're grown up. If, uh, if, they don't get the, if, they, if they don't get that message. So I think it's very important um, that uh, the message uh, go out to, to the teachers who they themselves are very interested and uh, very much want to and uh, are so capable and so successful at uh, carrying the information to the children that, uh, that they be reached. So I think that's a very, very important uh, aspect um, of uh, of dealing with the future because if people don't understand they'll that you just don't get it you can't get it at the at the end you've got to start at the beginning in, in order to understand what the processes are and see how it affects what we do every day what happens right in front of us so that that's my that's that's my pitch uh, yeah. education for children all the way all the, everywhere one thing I'll add to that is that Jesse Meckling, the, the, the education director, the, pro, the director for the education program at the center, teaches uh, fifth graders and seventh graders about what we do at the center. He takes them out, does field work. One of his first students, he's been here as almost as long as I have. One of his first students he taught in fifth grade was an intern uh, last year, I think, after she graduated high school at the Center for Coastal Studies. So you've got a thing where he's teaching these kids in fifth grade and seven, eight years later, they're coming to the center to, to participate. And that's, that's, that's pretty cool. And it's probably time for me to add my favorite story, which is I was one of the first people as a graduate student in college to take one of Dr. Geis's field studies walks where he opened my eyes to coastal processes and to rivers of sand and all the wonderful stuff that he's been talking about, Mark's been talking about. And here I am fortunate and honored to be working with these guys 40 years later. So. Uh, it is. That's a great message. And I think a great way to start wrapping up our conversation today, Graham. It's about sharing, educating, making people aware. And certainly the next generation behind us had better be aware of what's going on because they're going to have, they're going to be facing even more challenging issues than, than we're facing right now. Well, thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, we do have a lot of questions. We have so many questions, actually, that I think we're going to have to do this again at some point very soon. <laughs> um, one quick, very, very quick point. Um, Mark, could you just say something briefly about the new um, app that you are working on for um, looking at uh, storm tide pathways, sea level rise? In yes. The, the app, like I said, the app is available at the National Weather Service's webpage, and it's sort of a collateral duty for somebody there. So it's not updated as frequently as we would like and because they're just not able to. So we've, we've developed our own app in-house uh, to do this work. It's gonna be available on our website and quite frankly, it should be available in two months, right? It, it, relatively quickly. So, um, and we'll definitely get the word out when that happens and, uh, and we'll let everybody know because we wanna make it really simple for people to use uh, and really straightforward. And we're gonna update it constantly, which National Weather Service just doesn't have the time to do it, but we do. That's great, thank you. Yep. Um, well, I will wrap this up now if, if everybody's okay with that. Um, thank you everybody for attending and thank you for the questions. Um, we do have quite a few to get, to get back to. Um, 
most of you will be able to get back on through email. Maybe we'll even give you a call. Um, so thanks for attending. Thank you, Graham, Rich, and Mark. And I will hand over to Rich for a, for a final message. Well, thank you, Catherine, for getting us all together in this new new world, new normal world uh, format. Uh, but it does feel like we're getting one step closer back to uh, being able to connect with all our friends and members. And I'm really thrilled there are a number of you in the audience who are just discovering the, uh, the work that we're doing. Uh, we're proud of it. We've been doing it for 46 years. Uh, we intend to continue on because, as you just heard, the need for our kind of research and education and outreach activities, sadly, only seems to be increasing as more and more issues are impact the oceans and coasts. So we're going to continue on. We're going to persevere. Uh, but we do need your help to do that. Uh, so I would just ask as we close that uh, all of you who are on, online uh, and tell your friends about this, just visit our website, number one. And that's www.coastalstudies.org. You'll learn about not only all the great work that Dr. Geis and Dr. Uh, Borelli are doing, but we have 38 other people who are doing wonderful research in water quality and fisheries and endangered species and whale research and population studies. All of that stuff wrapped together is intertwined to have us helpfully understand the total picture of the oceans. And they're all impact, they're all interrelated. So please visit, learn more about us. If you get on our mailing list, Catherine sends out e-blasts and updates information and newsletters on a regular basis. That will help you stay informed. And then I have to ask you, there's always a little donate button on every page. And it would be wonderful if, uh, as you see that donate button from time to time, I receive a really nice letter from me three or four times a year telling you more about what we do and what we need. If you write that check, all of those would just really be wonderful because that's how we, that's how we exist. It's not just ourselves doing it. It's because you are part of us. You guys help us. So please uh, be generous when you can. Uh, learn about us. Spread the word. And thank you for being here today. This has been really great. Happy to have, really happy to have a chance to participate.